This Formula One car is so crazy, so fundamentally different, that rival teams banned it before it ever got to race. <laughs> The car I'm sitting in here is the Lotus Type 88. Now, you might look at this and think, okay, it's just another Formula One car from the 1980s, but you'd be wrong. This thing has something no F1 car has had before or since. Two chassis. Not six wheels, not a huge fan, but basically two separate cars working together as one. And when Colin Chapman's team rolled this out, every other team on the grid had the same reaction they were instantly terrified. Because if this car worked, and early signs suggested it really, really worked, then every other car on the grid was obsolete, instantly. Years of engineering work thrown in the bin. So they banned it, before it ever got a proper chance to race. The other teams killed it before Lotus could develop it properly. An entire concept, potentially revolutionary, snuffed out not because it was too dangerous or illegal, but because it was potentially too good. But here's what I wanna show you. I wanna take you inside this machine and explain exactly why it terrified the competition, how this twin chassis system actually worked, and most importantly, what might have happened if they actually let it race because this story isn't really about one car. It's about what happens when politics kills innovation. But first, you need to understand the problem this car was trying to solve. And it was a big problem. Okay, so late 1970s Formula One had just discovered something incredible, ground effect. Basically, if you shape the bottom of your car like an upside down wing and seal the edges, you create a massive low pressure zone underneath. The car gets literally sucked onto the track. And the downforce was insane. Cars could corner at speeds that would have been impossible just a few years earlier. But, and this is a big but, there was a catch. To make this work, those skirts had to maintain a perfect seal with the track. Any gap and very quickly, you lose all of your downforce and probably crash. So teams had to run their cars millimeters off the ground. And here's where the physics get really ugly. To keep that seal perfect, you had to spring the entire car like a brick, using springs that were much, much stiffer than before. But why so stiff? Well, two reasons. First, with softer springs and this much downforce pushing down, the car would literally drive itself into the ground. The aerodynamic forces were so massive, they'd compress soft springs until the floor was scraping the tarmac. Second, and this is where things get really tricky, Every time you brake, accelerate or turn, the car pitches and rolls. With soft springs, that movement aerodynamically is huge. When the car pitches forward under braking, the nose gets closer to the ground and the rear lifts slightly. That changes how the air flows underneath the car and the seals down the side get disrupted. Suddenly your center of pressure shifts forward and your total downforce changes. And the same thing happens when you accelerate out of the corner. The car squats, the airflow changes again, and now you've got completely different aerodynamics mid-corner. So you're not just losing grip, you're losing it unpredictably. The car's handling is constantly changing as the aerodynamics shift around. So the only solution were springs so stiff that the car barely moved at all. They kept that aerodynamic platform locked into place no matter what. But that created a whole different problem. Drivers were getting absolutely pummeled. And it wasn't just about comfort. The driver's feet were bouncing off the pedals and they were struggling to see. Plus, when a car has really stiff springs, it's not as good in the slower corners where you need the suspension to be supple. But the thing was, the aerodynamic benefits were so massive that people just accepted it. You either got beaten to death by your suspension or you got left behind. By 1980, every team was trapped with stiff suspension. There was no way to solve the issue. It was physically impossible, or so everyone thought. And Lotus came up with something completely different. To understand why Lotus was willing to try something this radical, you need to know how desperate they'd become. Colin Chapman was basically the Steve Jobs of Formula One, the guy who had revolutionized the sport multiple times over. He invented the modern F1 car with the first monocoque chassis back in 1962. 
He gave the sport proper aerodynamic wings. And most importantly, he created ground effect in the first place with the legendary Lotus 78 and 79. Chapman didn't just build cars. He reimagined what they could be. But by 1979, his latest creation, the Type 80, was a complete disaster. Chapman had pushed ground effect further than anyone else dared. Complex curved skirts, ultra low profile, everything. On paper, the car should have dominated. Instead, it was undrivable. The car would suddenly lose grip for no apparent reason. It would bounce and pitch uncontrollably. Chapman had spent a lot of time and money on this car and it was slower than last year's car. While Williams and Brabham were perfecting their ground effect, Lotus was going backwards fast. This was devastating for Chapman. He was 50 years old and had been the innovation king of F1 for two decades. Now he was watching newcomers eat his lunch. The Type 80 project had to be scrapped completely. Chapman needed something revolutionary, something that would leapfrog everyone else entirely. And that's when Peter Wright walked into his office with an idea that was either brilliant or completely insane. Now, the Lotus 88 was one of the most ambitious cars in F1 history, and researching how that system worked sent us down an engineering rabbit hole. So naturally, we turned to Brilliant. Brilliant is a problem-solving app with thousands of interactive lessons in physics, engineering, maths, data, and more. Instead of just watching videos, you're solving problems hand-on, a method proven to be six times more effective for building real understanding. One course I use is scientific thinking. It's perfect for breaking down concepts like load transfer, force, and structural dynamics. The kind of thinking Colin Chapman and his team used to dream up the Lotus 88. Whether you want to sharpen your STEM skills or just learn something rather than scrolling, you can try Brilliant free at brilliant.org forward slash driver61 and you'll get 20% off an annual premium subscription. So thank you to Brilliant and now back to the video. Now back to Wright's revolutionary idea that would change everything. So he knew the issue. You need stiff suspension for the aero and soft suspension for the driver and mechanical grip. But you can't have both. Or can you? His insight was that every F1 car was trying to make one structure do two completely different jobs. And Wright realized this was fundamentally impossible with one chassis. So he proposed something that had never been tried before. Build two cars, and stick them together. Chassis one, the inner chassis, carries the driver, the engine, the gearbox, all the mechanical stuff. This gets soft suspension so the driver isn't beaten and actually accelerates well out of slow corners. Chassis two, the outer chassis, carries all the bodywork, wings, and aerodynamic devices. This connects almost directly to the wheels with minimum movement. When the car hits a bump, the inner chassis rides it smoothly, while the outer chassis follows the track surface exactly. Now, here's where things get really clever. The way the aero platform works is if you imagine the car driving along, all of the air is rushing under the, the car's floor, right? Which is shaped like a, a big wing. We've got ground effect here. So it sucks the aero platform into the ground. Now, if you think about it, it's pulling it down, but it's not actually pulling down on anything. So it's just pulling the, the floor down, pulling the skirts down so they seal on the side of the floor. But the clever bit, is that the floor is then attached to this spring, um, which is also attached to this tether here. Once the floor comes all the way down to a certain point, it actually locks out. And so that load, once it stops, um, it kind of bottoms out just here. It then comes through this tether and pulls down. So the downforce then goes through the upright, the wheel, the tire, and straight directly into the track. So the aerodynamic shell gets locked solid onto the uprights, maintaining the perfect ride height. But the driver is sitting in the inner chassis above, riding on proper suspension. But Wright and Chapman knew that this would be controversial. The rules said that aerodynamic devices had to be sprung. Technically, their outer chassis, the aero part, was sprung through those gas struts. But it was unlike anything anyone had ever seen. Yeah, when it comes to Formula 1 regulations, there are always dubious areas. And um, what related to this, the Type 88 in particular, was the word chassis. The word chassis implies a singular or a plural. Um, so if it says the chassis of a car has to be fixed, 
what are we talking about here? Which chassis? If there's two chassis, who's to say? The regulations said the word chassis. For such an unusual car, the first tests were incredible. So the, the Type 88 f first appeared at the Long Beach Grand Prix in 1981, um, and it ran in practice sessions, um, and I think it did about 124 miles. So it was, it was looking good. It was fairly quick as a new car. There's always, there's always gonna be problems with a new car. Uh, but it looks good. Secret tests with Nigel Mansell at Harama had already shown massive potential. The car generated huge downforce without any of the stability problems that had killed the Type 80. And later at Paul Ricard, they tested alongside an Alfa Romeo. The Type 88 matched their lap time on its very first run with a driver who'd never been in the car before. But there was another revolutionary thing about this car that most people don't know. The main chassis unit of a Type 88 and all the cars um, from then on were uh, a work of art. The actual carbon fibre chassis tub section is a beauty, beautiful thing. The Type 88 had Formula One's first carbon fibre chassis. Not carbon fibre bodywork, the actual structural monocoque was made from carbon fibre. Now, McLaren usually gets the credit for this, but Lotus was apparently first, testing months before McLaren's MP41 ever turned a wheel. But the difference was that McLaren got to actually race their car and take the glory. However, Lotus's innovation got banned before anyone noticed. And the carbon fibre wasn't just about being first, it solved real problems. The twin chassis concept needed incredible stiffness in the inner chassis, mainly because it was very narrow, so the aero chassis could run on the outside of it. Traditional aluminium honeycomb wasn't strong enough, so Lotus developed these carbon fibre sheets that were both lighter and stiffer than anything that came before. But the twin chassis system had its own challenges. The aero chassis had to be prevented from lifting during cornering, which would break the aerodynamic seal and cause an instant loss of downforce. And Wright's solution was brilliantly simple. The outer body could compress easily under aerodynamic load, but the gas struts were set up so it took much longer to extend back up to pass ride height tests in the pits. In theory, it should have been faster and more drivable than anything else on the grid. But Chapman and Wright had badly underestimated the political reaction this would cause. So March 1981, the Long Beach Grand Prix in the US. The Type 88 rolls out of Lotus's garage for the first time in public. And the reaction from the other teams was instant. And it wasn't good. Think about it from their perspective. Every team had spent tons of money and time developing ground effect within the constraints of a single chassis design. And suddenly, here's Lotus saying, forget all that, we have found a completely different solution. If the Type 88 worked, everyone else would have to start again, completely. So the protest started immediately. Ferrari, Alfa Romeo and others, they all challenged the car's legality before it even hit the track. Now, here's the thing. Technically, the Type 88 was completely legal. It met every written regulation and there was no specific rule about having two chassis. But the governing body was under massive pressure and they ruled that while the car met the letter of the law, it violated the spirit of the regulations. But what exactly does that mean? It's completely subjective. Chapman was furious, and rightfully so. This wasn't about one car. It was about the fundamental principle of innovation in Formula One. Throughout these years, we have witnessed the changes which have taken place in Grand Prix racing, and unfortunately seen what was fair competition between sportsmen degenerate into power struggles and political manoeuvrings between manipulators and money men attempting to take more out of the sport than they put into it. But Chapman wasn't giving up. He hired lawyers and mounted a massive legal defence. The documentation from his efforts eventually filled an entire filing cabinet. But the political momentum was against him. Too many teams had too much to lose. So Lotus tried again. They modified the car for the British Grand Prix, calling it the Type 88B. They moved radiators around, changed how the bodywork was mounted, and hoped to address the concerns. The RSE scrutineers actually passed it as legal for Silverstone, and the cars practiced and showed competitive pace. But the FAA intervened again. It was the same process and the same political pressure. 
And while Lotus was being banned for their illegal innovation, other teams were likely running blatant cheats. For example, apparently Brabham had developed a system that hydraulically raised their car to pass ride height tests in the pits, then lowered it back down on track. And Peter Wright explained Colin's annoyance. Chapman was particularly incensed that Brabham were permitted to race a car that raised itself hydropneumatically to pass the six centimeter test in the pit lane and then lowered itself on the track. Chapman's defense became obsessive. He was 53, had already revolutionized the sport multiple times, but this battle represented something bigger. It was a fight for the soul of innovation itself. Unfortunately, the twin chassis concept was banned permanently. Chapman, who was devastated by what he saw as the sport's descent into politics, gradually lost interest in racing. He died just over a year later, his final innovation stillborn. The twin chassis concept died with him, relegated to a footnote in F1 history. But it's still something that every modern F1 car struggles with, the same compromises that Wright and Chapman actually solved. But the question that haunts everyone who knows this story is what if they'd let it race? How competitive would it have actually been? Unfortunately, we'll never know how fast or competitive this car would have been. Could it have won some races? If you enjoyed this video, check out this other one, which I think you'll love. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time.